We're in the Psalms today, Psalm 42. What, what is a psalm? Well, a psalm is a song or a poem that was used in worship. They were the hymns of the Old Testament, the choruses of the Old Testament. And singing is a great way to learn and to memorize truth. And they were also prayers. When we worship God today, even our songs are prayers. And we also sing in a way that we learn about God. And we learn to praise him and get our eyes on the Lord. And the Psalms are, in the Bible, a great way for us to learn how to pray, to learn how to talk to God and how to worship God. Now, you might see at the top of Psalm 42, it says, Book 2. And he's like, what, what's that? What's going on there? Well, at some point in Israel's history, before the oldest manuscripts that we have, they took the 150 Psalms and they compiled them into five big books. I imagine they didn't all fit into one scroll. And so Psalm 1 to 41 is book one, and Psalm 42 begins book two. And we have all 150 Psalms in one book, and we have the whole Bible today at our fingertips. What a blessing. Wasn't always that way. Now, Psalm 42 and 43, they can be read together as if they are one psalm. They're separate psalms, but they can easily be studied together. And it's quite possible they were originally written down, composed as one song, and then separated into two shortly after. And we, we know that because there are some phrases in Psalm 42 that are repeated exactly in Psalm 43. And 43 doesn't have its own heading in the original text, meaning it probably was just separated at one point. Uh, it's kind of like part one and part two. <laughs> so we can read them individually or take them together, and we'll do that today, take them together. Now you might see also, but before you get into verse one, <clears throat> it has a different font in my Bible, and it says, to the chief musician, a contemplation of the sons of Korah. Now, the word contemplation there is the word maskil in the Hebrew, and it means that this was to be uh, a teaching or considered instructive. And it was to be sung publicly to instruct God's people how to worship. Now, Ray Stedman is one of my favorite writers, and he says that a maskil means a teaching, and this psalm was intended specifically to teach us how to handle our blue moods. When we wake up in the morning and we ask, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And how do we handle that? How do we think through that? Well, the author of this psalm, it doesn't say the author, but it does say a contemplation of the sons of Korah. Now, the Korah sons, they were Levites. They were from the family of Kohath, and they served as worship leaders in the Old Testament in Israel. Now, my Bible also has another heading saying, yearning for God in the midst of distresses. I think that heading is added later as like a topic or a theme. And Psalm 42 and 43 are about this emotional low and how to process that. The writer was going through a personal time of adversity and struggle in their life. And they write here openly about their feelings, about their doubts, and about their questions. And they express a very real lack of peace and a lack of joy in their life. And they call out with longing to God. Now, the psalm doesn't give us any more specific background circumstances when it was written or exactly what was happening. So the application is left wide open for all of us to relate to this psalm in different situations in our life. Maybe you're going through a real time of spiritual dryness, a drought, so to speak. Maybe you're in a time of deep sadness. And it could be a particular circumstance that's weighing heavily upon you. Or maybe there's just been a slow drift from where you used to be in your fellowship with God. Maybe a distance has grown between you and, and the encouraging community of faith. We can all relate to this psalm in any kind of distress or dry season. And let me just say before we start verse 1, it is not uncommon for the people of God to go through very deep and personal valleys. We're not promised to always be on the mountaintop. Men and women of God have experienced deep times of confusion, deep times of discouragement. David, he's a psalmist. He definitely experienced times of that deep discouragement. I think of Moses. He asked God to kill him. 
And God said no. <laughs> but he was low. Elijah, he also pleaded with the Lord, just take my life. When he ran from Jezebel, he wanted to die, but, and he felt he was the only one left who really was serving God in the nation. And God corrected him and taught him and said, no, there's, there's still a remnant. I still have a plan. John the Baptist, he was low in prison. He was confused about what God was doing. Jeremiah wept day and night. And, and even when you go through church history and you read great Christian biographies, of men and women of God in recent history, many of them have gone through deep personal valleys. Spurgeon is one of my favorite guys to read, and he called this the fainting fits of God's ministers. A great chapter in his famous book to young pastors is called, the, the book's called Lectures to My Students by Charles Spurgeon. And my favorite chapter is uh, this one about his fainting fits, at his times of real depression in his life. And he said, it, and I'll just quote a little bit of that chapter before we dive in here. And I'm slightly paraphrasing Spurgeon to put it into really understandable language. But he said it like this. He said, be not dismayed by soul trouble. Cast not away your confidence in God. Even if the enemy's foot be on your neck, expect to rise and overthrow him. Cast the burden of the present along with the sin of the past and the fear of the future upon the Lord, who never forsakes us. He said, live by the day, even by the hour. Put your trust or put no trust in frames and feelings. Care more for a grain of faith than for a ton of excitement. And when we cannot see the face of God, trust him under the shadow of his wings. Powerful words. And it's encouraging to know many of our heroes of our faith have struggled with feeling cast down and dismayed and confused. God uses the valleys to teach us many things about the depths of his faithfulness. God always has his best in mind for us to teach us and transform us and to use us for his glory. And this psalm teaches us how to handle those seasons of being low. Look at verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Notice how he starts out by identifying his emotions and describing the state of his soul. I'm so thirsty for you, God. Like a deer searching for water, fainting from thirst, my soul is longing for the presence of the living God. And out of this emotional fog, the writer is able to identify his need. He needs the presence of God to be clear and fresh in his life. The Bible tells us that we are spiritual beings. We're created by God to have fellowship with God and to live for the purposes of God. And when we're separated from God and from that purpose, from his design for our life, from that intimate relationship, then we will never be satisfied. And so he formulates a question in verse 2. When shall I come and appear before God? When will God and I reconnect again? The truth is there is absolutely no satisfaction in this world in anything other than the Lord himself. Idols cannot satisfy. They only pull our hearts away from God and enslave us to themselves. Any pursuit that tries to replace a personal relationship with the living God well, it may feel exciting for, for a short time, but it will leave us empty and lost, getting more stuff, getting more money, getting more things. Earthly security, it will always leave us empty. Pursuing a great goal might be a, a good thing, but it becomes an idol. Education, achievements, they won't satisfy. Entertainment, toys, hobbies, even relationships, even Christian ministry, it never satisfies. Only God himself. Those things will always leave us empty. But God himself wants to be that fresh, flowing, living water like a brook. And we're panting, we're desperate, we're, we're thirsty for him. Now the psalmist here, he's from Israel. He could have said, I'm like a camel. I go for a drink once a month and I'm good. I go for maybe a couple a week, 
at the most, I'm good. But no, he said, I'm like a deer. And a deer doesn't have that store, that resource in themselves. A deer needs that fresh water every day. And so too, we need the Lord every day. Jeremiah chapter 2, he spoke about this. And Jeremiah was actually rebuking the nation. And God spoke through him, Jeremiah 2.13. And he was really troubled. God was troubled about Israel and Judah. And he said to them, my people have committed two evils, two sins. Number one, they've forsaken me. And number two, they've hewn, and he said, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And number two, they have hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, a cistern is a man-made reservoir. Rain was rare and precious in Israel, so they dug out a basin in the rock, and when it rained, the water would channel into the, to this like reservoir. And then it would last for a while until the rock cracked and the water slowly seeped away. And if it's dry after the rain, there's, at least you have some water in the reservoir. The problem is it's still water, which means it's not living, it's not, it's not fresh. And you go to a cistern or a reservoir and you look in there and, and there's creepy crawlies in there. There's, there's life forms in there. You want a drink? And the Lord says, they've, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. My dad uh, has a place out in Canmore, Alberta. And when we stayed there, he says, you know, I figured out how to, how to have water out here, the best water you'll ever drink. And he bought one of those five gallon jugs, empty. And he said, here's a little map, go out of the cabin, go up the, the mountain and go to the edge of the pathway over here to get out your car, go up a little ways. And there's a living spring of fresh spring water right there. And I remember doing that and just filling that jug up and taking some, some drink out of that. Man, the sweetest, the most fresh water. I just I forget pop and juice. Like, I don't want that spring water. So much better. And that's our Lord. He is like that to us. And when we go to idols, it's like we're digging out a little reservoir, a little cistern, and it's just full of creepy crawlies, and, and that's what we're drinking from. It's not going to last. Jesus talked about this too. And Jesus actually applied this picture to his own, well, to himself. And Jesus said in John chapter 7, on the last day of the feast, the great day, he stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow torrents of living water. That, that's the, the wellspring of God's love and God's presence. And it's so rich to us that we can't hold it in. David said, my cup overflows. It's like, I, I just, I'm so full of the Lord's love, I can't hold it back. That's the kind of relationship you were made for. And that's what the psalmist is crying out. And he, and he doesn't have it. He's far from God. He's saying, I'm like a deer. I'm panting. I, I want to appear before God again. Look at verse 3, Psalm 42, 3. He says, my tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? And he's describing a place of weeping. He's lost his appetite for food. He can't shake this heaviness. He can't even sleep. And he's being real. He's admitting how sad he is. It's good for us to admit when we're struggling, to be honest with ourselves and to be real with God, to bring our need to him. Nothing surprises the Lord. And we can pray like the psalmist with a raw prayer, Lord, I'm just weeping right now. I just, I'm so far from you. I don't get it. I'm so heavy. And he also adds in verse three, some people were mocking him. And when we get to verse 10, we'll see that, that, that some enemies who are saying, where is your God? And sometimes we go through a trial as Christians and people who don't know the Lord, they look at us and they know we're a believer and they, they say, you're a Christian. How come you're going through such a hard time? Why has God deserted you? And they don't really help us. <laughs> and when we're going through a hard time, they say, why do you bother praying? That's not going to help. You need to take action. You need to read this self-help book. You need to et cetera, et cetera. And they, they mock our faith. Be careful of the voices you listen to. The psalmist in verse 3, on the inside, 
He's got despair, and on the outside, he's got mockery. And he mustn't listen to either the inside or the outside. He's got to look up to the Lord. He's got to turn his eyes to God. Because all he's got is discouragement from within and without. Look at verse 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept the pilgrim feast. So the psalmist here is remembering better days. And this verse seems to tell that the writer was probably a worship leader at some level. And he wrote it while he was away from Jerusalem, away from the temple, the center of worship in Israel. He's away from the fellowship he's used to. And, and being away from fellowship with God's people adds to that dry feeling, to that spiritually cast down state. He remembers the days he used to gather with the crowds of worshipers, when he used to sing and worship with the congregation, when he saw and witnessed the power of God in the family of God at the gatherings and at the feasts. I don't know why the psalmist was separated from fellowship here, but he's not gathering with God's people when he writes this. And he's realizing how much he's lost by breaking that fellowship. And we don't know why. Maybe he, he chose to stop attending. Maybe he was forced to by some circumstance. He might have been traveling to minister to people far away. He might have gone to war like David. He might have been sick or, or unable to attend. We don't know, but we can all relate because anytime we're broken from the fellowship of God's people and we're missing that worship time and that, that real opening of our lives, that sharpening of one another, it, it's like a hot coal in a fire that's then separated out on its own in the dark night. And, and that hot coal will not stay warm very long on its own. It needs that fellowship. And so do we. Let us never underestimate the call of God to continue in close fellowship with God's people. What a blessing it is, how much it helps us. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We need one another to do that. And then it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as we see the day approaching. We know the times are hard and we need to build each other up. In Acts chapter 2, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer. And God blessed them, and they, they ate their food with gladness, with simplicity of heart. They met together regularly and worshiped and, and learned the word. We need that. Fellowship is essential. And if circumstances have pushed us away, we must do all that we can to get back together again with God's people. Look at verse 5. And this is really the heart of the psalm. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. I love verse 5. Verse 5 is kind of like the chorus. You know, in our modern songs, we come back to the chorus, you know, sing a couple verses, chorus, a couple more, chorus, and at the end, chorus, chorus. <laughs> That's what we're going to see. This, this line will be repeated at the end of the psalm and again at the end of 43 as well. And it's the main message, the central theme here is how to talk to ourselves when we are cast down. Look at verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? He's been lamenting and processing and writing down his emotions up to this point, realizing he's not in a good place spiritually. And then he turns and he challenges himself. And he says, soul, why are you cast down? Why are you so disquieted? The word disquieted means commotion and trouble, feeling disturbed and, and just troubled. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he puts it like this. You have to take yourself by the hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself and say to your soul, why art thou cast down? What business have you being disquieted? That's good. Self-talk. Instead of listening to yourself, you have to talk to yourself. You have to tell yourself and, and ask yourself, why are you so troubled? Oh, think about the big picture, soul. Have a word with yourself sometimes. 
Colin, what's going on today? Why have you woken up and got going and, and you're so cast down? It's now time to, to pivot and to turn and to hope in God. Look at verse 5. He says, hope in God. He's telling himself, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. I know I'm not praising him fully, joyfully right now, but I will. If I put my hope in God, if I trust in him, if I look up and I believe in him, then I know he's going to bring that praise and that joy back into my life. He will bring that smile back to my life because he, his countenance is smiling down on me. He loves me and he's faithful and God has not left me. God is working even when I can't see it. God is teaching me things in this time and he's teaching me now how to talk to myself and pull myself out of the pit. I think of uh, basketball a little bit here. Now I'm not an expert at basketball, but I remember high school being trained and you can't travel with the ball. You can't just run with it in your hand. You have to have one foot planted. And so they call it the pivot move where you're holding the ball and you, you pick one foot to just stay planted. And then the other foot you can turn and change direction holding the ball. And in a way, the planted foot is a picture of our, our, our literal state, our emotions, our feelings. We're cast down. I can't change that. I got to acknowledge it. I got to realize it. But you know what I can do is even while I'm in that state, I can turn myself to face the Lord and I can look to him. Hope in God for I shall yet praise him. Like Spurgeon said, care more for a grain of faith than for a ton of excitement. We can't always see the face of God, but we can trust him under the shadow of his wings. And the psalmist tells us to trust God, doubt your doubts, believe your beliefs, take control of your thoughts. And then look at verse six. He says, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. See, now he's really bringing it to the Lord. Oh my God. Now he's pivoted, he's turned, and he's bringing all this emotion directly to God. Verse six, therefore, I will, re will remember you from the land of Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar, now he's remembering God. He's putting his focus back on the Lord. Wherever he is, whether he's describing the location he's at or things he did in the past, places he went in the past, he's remembering the goodness of God wherever he is. Verse 7, deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. That's describing a, a storm, a tumult. His emotions, he's feeling like he's in the depths of despair, swallowed up in a flood. Deep calls unto deep. It's, it's God's heaviness that, that I can't shake. And it's, I feel so deeply depressed here. Verse 8, the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night, his song shall be with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Now faith is talking. He's looked to the Lord. He's pivoted. He's turned. And he's given his soul, his heart to the Lord, his troubles. He's admitted that he feels so deep. And now he says, I know that the Lord will command his loving kindness in my life. In the daytime, I'll know his love. In the nighttime, I'll have a song in my heart, a prayer to the God of my life. See, he's really made the decision to talk to his own soul, to not listen to the voice of tears and depression, to not listen to the, the mockery of the world, but to look up to the Lord, to hope in God. And now he knows that He's praying to the Lord, a prayer to the God of my life. He's the God of my life. He's the living God. He's the one who's with me. And this is faith talking. Even though he may not be feeling anything, faith is acting. Faith is talking, believing the word of God, taking him at his word. God is faithful. God will not leave me. God is going to get me through this. And God is going to teach me what I need to know. Verse 9, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Now, that's an interesting statement there. On one hand, he's saying, God is my rock. He's stable. He's secure. But at the same time, it feels like you've forgotten me, Lord. Anyone ever felt that way? I think we feel that way often. Uh, God, where is he? Why isn't he answering my prayers? Why has he forgotten me? Look at verse 9 at the end. Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? So it's interesting. He's questioning in his heart, God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? And then his enemies come and, and they just kick him while he's down. Yeah, where is your God? 
Why, why are you going through this suffering? I, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I know God is faithful. And I'm going to look up. I'm going to hope in God. Soul, it's time to hope in God. That's the message of this psalm. Look at verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. We know that the enemy of our soul, Satan, will always kick us when we're down. We mustn't listen to him. Ephesians 6 says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness in this age. Satan has a plan to kick you while you're down, and he will do his best to do that. But that's why we need to be in the word of God. You see, Satan cannot control our emotions. He cannot get in there and actually wreck us from the inside. We are now saved. We're born again. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. But Satan has a plan to deceive us, so we will destroy our own life by listening to his deception. Like Eve saying, oh, okay, I, I want that, and, and biting of that forbidden fruit. Satan didn't control her to do that. She did it. He deceived her. Satan is a decoy merchant. He can't control us, but he can put a decoy out there, put a distraction out there, put a discouragement there so that we get our eyes off the Lord and then we start listening to all the negativity. And we start giving into it all. We start going down that path. And we go so far down it that we can't see the Lord anymore. And then we start making choices that are against our faith, against God, against our conscience, and it just wrecks us. That, that's the spiritual battle, the deception of the devil. We've got to stay in the word of God. This is the, the armor of God is first put on the belt of truth. And also the last piece, take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God. We cannot go a day without this book because God wants to be your living source of water, that joy, that, that refreshment. How are you, you going to meet with God? Right here. Spending time with him, letting his own words speak to your heart. Don't put this book down. Get back into the word of God. Find a fresh way to journal your thoughts, to, to go through a new book, to, to get it going again, to, to get moving in your listening and your writing down what God is saying to your heart through the word of God, because this is the truth that will set you back free, that will, will recalibrate you to God's truth and reality in the spiritual battle. Verse 11 is the emphasis. It's the refrain. The conclusive lesson that the psalmist has learned is how to talk to himself in that trial and say, soul, come on. It's time to turn. It's time to pivot. It's time to put your hope in God. You know, even Jesus went through the dark night of the soul. It says in Matthew 26, after he washed their feet, and he was going to the Garden of Gethsemane right before being crucified. Jesus said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Jesus said, I feel like I could die right now because of the sorrow. Now, Jesus, he was, about, he was just starting to, to bear the sins of the whole world upon him that night. And he knew the tragedy that was coming, that the, the hour of darkness that he was about to be exposed to and he did it for us. And when we go through an hour of darkness, a season of the valley, we know one who really understands, who actually suffered a lot more than us. Jesus took the sins of the whole world. We don't. We have our own sin to deal with. We have a sinful world. We have all the circumstances of the fallen world around us. We have a lot of trouble. Jesus had more. And Jesus went through that valley and he trusted in God. And even on the cross, why have you forsaken me, Father? But he knew and he believed and he trusted God. And he did his Father's will. He delighted to do the will of the Father, even in that time of suffering. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And that joy was to please his Father. And his joy was to redeem you and to save you. And for you, Jesus took that pain and that suffering. And so, too, in our lives, we can bring our pivot and turn back to the Lord and say, God, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what's going on, but I know you hold the future. I know you absolutely love me, that you understand what's going on, and I put my hope in you. And soul, it's time to hope in God and to talk to ourselves that way. Jeremiah 29, a great promise. 
God says, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, thoughts to give you a future and give you a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Now look at Psalm 42, uh, 43. And if 42 is the struggle, 43 is the victory. And there's a little bit of the struggle still, but it comes through with a procession of praise. And we'll go through 43 a little quicker. Verse 1, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. So he's praying, God, would you be my justice? Would you vindicate me? Would you fight off uh, the ungodly who are uh, being deceitful and, and, and criticizing me beyond what is right. Verse 2, for you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? God, you're my strength. Why am I suffering so much? Notice he's got both the reality, I am suffering, and the faith. God, you are still my strength. I believe it. I don't feel it right now, but I believe it. God, you are my strength. That's faith. Faith is based on the word of God, not feeling happy, feeling strong, feeling confident, but, but believing the word of God is true. And taking a stand, making a choice in, in light of the word of God. And he's saying, I'm putting my hope not in other people. I'm not putting my hope in, in myself, in my techniques, in the world. I'm putting my hope in God. Verse 3. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them lead me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Oh, I love verse 3. That's a good one to circle and star and highlight if you do that in your Bible. Let me paraphrase verse 3, super simple. Send me your truth, lead me by your truth, and bring me back to you. That's what he's praying. Lord, send out your light and your truth. Those are the same things. Light exposes the problem. Truth exposes the problem. Send me your light and your truth. Into my darkest time, Lord, you've allowed this darkness, and now I'm longing for your light. You've allowed this dryness in my soul. I'm longing for the fountain of the water brooks of your presence again, Lord. And he knew here that to get reconnected with God's presence meant he had to acknowledge the truth and he had to let the light of God's word shine into his heart and reveal things. <laughs> For us to get real close to God, we got to let the light shine in. Ephesians chapter 5 puts it like this. It says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And all things that are exposed are made manifest by light, and whatever makes manifest or reveals things is light. That's Ephesians 5. In other words, if you want to, to, to really get close to God again, you've got to surrender. You've got to let him shine the truth into your life. Now, there was no specific sin that the psalmist is confessing here. He hasn't like, this isn't when David committed adultery or murdered Uriah or whatever. This, is, this, this guy is just in a spiritual funk. And he's not confessing a specific sin, but he's realizing, I need the light. I need the truth because I'm messed up. <laughs> I'm a sinner. I live in a fallen world. And Lord, there might be things that I don't even acknowledge are sin, that I don't even realize you're offended by. Send your light and your truth. And Lord, let me humble myself and confess it to you. Psalm 119 the entrance of your words gives light, and it gives understanding to the simple. God's word reveals the truth. And Psalm, or sorry, 1 John chapter 1, it says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. How can we have fellowship with God if we're holding on to some darkness in our life? In God, there is light and no darkness. And if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And first John goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So verse three, no specific sin, but Lord, as you reveal yourself, there might be something that I need to confess, and I'm open. And that's the right heart. That's the way to get back to a close walk with God, is to really humble yourself and, and be ready for God to fully correct you and for you to totally surrender 
That's what this is going, this is what this is all about, is a relationship with him. That's where the, the joy comes in, is when we're, we're, our conscience is, is washed and cleansed because we're making the right choices again. And we're saying, God, forgive me, and, and I come back into the light. I'm not hiding under the rocks like those little bugs. I'm coming out into the light, Lord. Verse 4, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. So there's the return of a full surrender. He said, I'm coming to the altar. The altar, of course, is a picture of surrender, of laying ourselves down before the Lord to be fully consumed by him. And he says, as I come to surrender to God, I, I receive that exceeding joy, that exceeding praise. Lord, yes, I'm coming back to you. Fill me with that joy and that praise. And then he says there's this personal connection again with God. He says, God, you are my God. You're mine. And I know you, and you're speaking to me. You're ministering to my soul today. And verse 5, there it is, the refrain once again. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted, troubled within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. This is how we have to encourage ourselves and talk to ourselves. And again, don't listen to yourself. Talk to yourself. Tell yourself it's time to get back hoping in God. Now, David didn't write this psalm that we know of, but David is a good example of this. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, there's a story. I'll just explain it. It's the greatest defeat of David's life. In Psalm or sorry, 1 Samuel 30, he goes out to war, and when he comes back, his whole village and camp with all his families of his soldiers, all his children, they've been ransacked by an enemy. They've been taken. And, and it was a total depressing event in his life. And it says that David... It says he was greatly distressed for the people they spoke of stoning him. And the soul of the people were grieved. And every man was grieved for his sons and his daughters. But then it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. It's a little line there in the New King James. David strengthened himself in the Lord. In that moment of total despair, absolute nothing to hope in here. It's all gone. And then he says he strengthened himself in the Lord. What do we learn today? Be honest about your doubts, about your fears, about your disappointments, about your state. Be honest with God. And then as you talk to yourself, pivot. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Talk to your soul. Why are you cast down? It's time to hope in God, soul. Remind yourself of his promises. Get back into the word of God. Remember the way he's blessed you. Count your many blessings and then confess any idol, any area of sin that's convicting in your heart and your life as you open the word of God. Confess it to the Lord. Lay yourself down as a living sacrifice and come back to the only true satisfaction for the soul and that is a true personal right relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. He is the satisfaction that we're longing for. And I close by just reading Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and that perfect will of God. Let's bow our heads. Maybe you're here today in a place where you are cast down, where you're dry and feeling distant from God. This was God's word to you today. Hope in God. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. The Lord is calling you to fully surrender, to put your 
trust in him. And to say, Lord, you're the one I'm longing for. And Lord, I'm going to trust you today. I'm going to trust your word. Soul, it's time to hope in God. And to make choices that reflect that hope. To put on praise music. To read the word every day again. To write down prayers and, and journal thoughts from the word. And, and to encourage others with the comfort that I've been comforted with. And Lord, would you guide me? Would you fill me? Would you restore to me the joy of my salvation? Would you fill me again afresh? Send out your light. Send out your truth, Lord. Let them lead me. Let them bring me back to you. And let me fully surrender to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.